Thank you very much for taking out time for a busy schedule uh, for today's CSH Hub webinar. Um, the title of um, my talk as announced may be a little bit too ambitious in the sense of uh, solving climate change and social inequalities uh, with statistical physics tools uh, is definitely not um, uh, what I can claim uh, of doing. Um, however, what I want to share with you is uh, how resilience and sustainability um, uh, can be addressed from an engineer's perspective. So this is my story of uh, uh, statistical physics as uh, related to resilience and sustainability, and that of my students and collaborators, my former students, Jake Roxon, Talal Mula, my current uh, graduate student, Benzu, Eli, Costas, Tina, and Katya, and uh, many colleagues here at MIT and from CNRS. Um, the topic I want to uh, uh, address is statistical physics. So let me just say two words about what statistical physics actually is. Statistical physics deals with the internal structure of observable phenomena. Just think about uh, a gas. We never know where the gas molecules are, but we still can say something about temperature, about pressure of uh, a gas, despite the fact that uh, uh, from any moment in any moment in time, the position of uh, the gas molecule changes. And that is made uh, possible through what is uh, coined thermodynamic ensembles, or as engineers know it uh, differently as boundary conditions to define equilibrium states as average over microstates within time or space. Um, and uh, thanks to this uh, approach, the statistics of uh, these microstates provide access to phase properties. Um, all engineers use uh, derivatives. So if we have enough random variables to characterize microstates, we can use them to extract valuable engineering information. And this requires a wealth of simulation tools to capture and generate these microstates, uh, which are mostly uh, discrete particle based. And from an engineering perspective, it enables data centric engineering. So, what I want to do today is to bring these tools uh, uh, into the realm of resilience with one clear focus to enhance the resilience of buildings and communities and cities. Let's first start out with a clear definition of what resilience is. Resilience is not just robustness of a system, which is the drop in performance or specific functionality at an extreme event. The remaining uh, functionality is coined robustness. But what makes resilience actually is the time it takes to bring a system after such an extreme event back to the same or higher performance. And that's what I would like to address today in the context of uh, the following uh, three uh, uh, extreme events, hurricanes, precipitation, flooding, and fire. Hurricanes, we are in the second half of the hurricane season uh, cost billions of dollars our society worldwide. Precipitation flooding is increasing uh, an unprecedented rate, and it's expected even more to increase as uh, we uh, 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 face the perils of global warming. And fire, I think I don't need to tell anybody on the West Coast or the Western part of this country uh, uh, what uh, um, uh, high, uh, fire means for resilience of uh, buildings, communities, etc. So let me start out with hurricanes and city texture. And uh, 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 my first point, which I want to make is that urban geometry magnifies or reduces wind loads. But I also want to address the question, what is the socioeconomic impact and how to reduce it? So here's a picture of Hurricane Maria, September 2017. What you see on the left side is uh, a damage map of different buildings. 
And what you realize, uh, actually, that if you take out one of those buildings, those buildings are not entirely destroyed, but they definitely have a loss of functionality here, for instance, uh, uh, the loss uh, of uh, a window. So when we speak about resilience, we not only speak about the stability of a structure, but we speak equally uh, about these non-structural elements, be these windows, et cetera. And if we want to talk about the socioeconomic impact, it suffices to think about uh, uh, the people who live in those buildings and ask ourselves um, who is most affected by these um, events. Well, Hurricane Michael, another picture, 2018, um, uh, this picture has become famous because the only structure uh, which uh, survived in the front line, the building was uh, a concrete building and uh, much more on Mexico Beach in Florida was destroyed. The point here to be noted is uh, this was a hurricane category four with wind speeds 130 to 150 miles per hour, which is exactly what the uh, wind uh, maps or speed wind speed maps uh, from the American Society of Civil Engineers um, predict. But why is it then that we see this extreme events? Well, we're going to see more of those here. Uh, the graph here shows that uh, over the 21st century, we expect a huge rise in this high category four to five hurricanes uh, during the uh, um, 21st century. So we need to do now something to address the problem. The fact that we observe every year the enormous damage of structures and uh, doing harm to our communities indicates that something isn't working in the current practice. So my first point here is, have we not seen enough uh, then here, how to address this actually these uh, 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 extreme events and uh, um, make our communities more resilient. So my point here uh, I want to make is that classical engineering approaches based on mean field theories from be it on city scale to structural resilience, i.e. continuum theories, fail to capture the key nature of hazard events which relates to fluctuations. And fluctuation is actually the key component which uh, statistical physics knows how to address. As I said before, buildings are designed to withstand a certain pressure. A pressure P relates to the wind speed. And here on the right hand, you see the wind speed maps of ASC, uh, wind speed to the power two, density rho, and then this drag coefficient. So since our structures are designed uh, um, in the classical engineering way to withstand these wind speeds and uh, uh, the formula is absolutely relevant, there must be something wrong with the drag coefficient at the city scale. Well, so uh, let me return to the October 10 Hurricane Michael uh, making landfall in Florida with the speeds 140 to 160 uh, uh, miles uh, per hour. And uh, the first point what we uh, can do is we can launch um, computational fluid dynamic simulations in order to identify what does a category four hurricane imposed as a boundary condition generates in terms of wind, wind speeds actually within the canyons of the city. So as you can see in, in this uh, image, the category four uh, hurricane imposed on the outside here becomes inside the city far beyond a category five or even higher uh, uh, hurricane wind speeds. As a consequence, the buildings are subject to a much higher uh, pressure for which they were not designed. So how can we actually capture this here? Well, the damage map of Mexico Beach actually shows, uh, tells a, a very strong uh, uh, picture. 54% of buildings were destroyed, 23 were severely damaged. So 77% of buildings. And if we compare uh, uh, the drag coefficient from the determined pressure on the buildings, 
to which each building was subjected, we actually realized that, uh, that uh, the drag coefficient on the buildings due to city texture actually is a fantastic means of getting a first order evaluation of why 73% of buildings were destroyed. Simply the drag coefficient, which we consider currently in our design codes for a building design uh, uh, for inner city buildings is simply too low uh, in order to capture uh, uh, city texture effects on the pressure to which buildings are subject. So the first uh, message here is city texture measures, uh, matters for urban resilience, uh, which is not considered in current design codes, which thus underestimate the amplifying effect of city texture on building design uh, pressure. So a key solution here would be to incorporate city texture, so local information into the drag coefficient into local design codes. So how can we this particular case study of uh, one community, uh, uh, Mexico Beach in Florida, to a more general phase? So what we do here is we employ tools of statistical physics in order to, uh, to, to classify and quantify the texture of cities. What we do here is we determine what is coined the pair distribution function. What does it, this pair distribution function actually do? Well, it estimates the variation from the low, from the average density, the variation from the average density at a local level for each one of those buildings. So this is readily achieved today with the tools available, uh, open street map, extracting buildings, and, and uh, translating this year in uh, the, the information about buildings into this pair distribution function. And if we start analyzing these uh, pair distribution functions, we find out that uh, some cities like Seattle have a very much uh, uh, similar geometric layout, like a liquid, liquid argon here. Or uh, Chicago has a very crystal structure, uh, 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 similar like uh, crystal argon. This information becomes key in order to scale this method up from one individual community to the scale of um, uh, 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 larger communities, states, and ultimately uh, uh, to the scale of, uh, of a state or a country. So to, just to reinforce that aspect, Paris is like a gas, San Francisco is also a very, has also a very crystalline structure. What is interesting to note here that the order of a city, the order of a city here, uh, uh, matters uh, is a direct function of the average numbers of neighbors which we have, which makes a lot of sense as um, you uh, put more buildings into a city. So having more neighbors for each uh, building, we increase the disorder. This information uh, can become uh, critical then here for looking on uh, a particular case here, Hurricane Irma, I think Sarasota and Lee County's category was uh, three hurricane, yet one uh, uh, area, Lee County, had extensive damage, Sarasota County has had very little, despite the fact that both were situated on the same side of the hurricane. So the question is, why? Well, to give you here the information here is basically, if you look at Lee County, the highly ordered structure of Lee County, you readily realize that there's a highly organized structure of the city. In contrast, if you look at Sarasota, you realize actually that there's a higher disorder. This order disorder immediately translates into higher drag coefficient for Lee County and thus to a higher pressure on the buildings on average in Lee County. So it is thus not surprising that uh, the geometric layout uh, uh, in Lee County and Sarasota County, so the city texture actually affects the drag coefficient and thus the resilience of uh, the uh, community. We can then generalize this here uh, as a tool 
So to obtain a drag coefficient, which just uh, uh, depend on very few parameters like uh, the ratio between wall surface and area of the building in order to scale the number of neighbors of a building here to the drag coefficient, which can then be used for the purpose of uh, design of uh, structures. Well, that's precisely what we did as we looked at uh, the state of Florida. You see here, we took uh, 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 the uh, uh, open street map, all the buildings which are in the area and determined which one of those buildings have a low, moderate or high degree, which means having a, a, a drag coefficient, which is within the norm, low, uh, up to 50% above the current norm and more than 50% in red. So what you can see by simply looking at the red colors here, you realize there are quite a few buildings here who are uh, in the high category. You see an, uh, the, the resolution of it here, this goes all the way down to uh, the building scale. So high-risk buildings should be clearly prioritized for resilience retrofits or considered for premium home insurance plans uh, uh, in order to minimize uh, uh, the damage caused by hurricanes. So that was at the community scale. Now the question is, how do we bring this here to uh, the building scale? How do we know which elements break, which are key actually to make estimations of uh, the cost for uh, and then the time to recovery. Key. The key here is not to consider only the structural performance, but as well the non-structural elements, which are critical for resilience. The method which we're using here, again, molecular inspired on the left-hand side, you see actually a molecular structure of graphene which has much in common with the layout of, um, of a, 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 a floor a plan of a high-rise building. In fact, the tools of molecular dynamics or molecular simulations allow us to incorporate in the interaction between mass points, the energy of those interactions. So for instance, what you see on the right-hand side is a nailed uh, connection between two wood beams on the left-hand side, you see the calibration of uh, these uh, uh, interactions here of this uh, uh, particular point in terms of moment uh, uh, angle of variation um, uh, uh, of uh, this particular uh, corner. And you see that these molecular tools which describe those interactions are perfectly able to capture, uh, uh, to capture the energy content of all these connections. We then incorporate those here into buildings in order to design structures. So for instance, what we can carry out is a uh, validation. Um, uh, we uh, validated this here for uh, wood, uh, for pasta, where you have on the right-hand side a projectile arriving and breaking up the material on the right-hand side. You see how well actually these MD tools uh, capture uh, the energy and the breakage of the bonds uh, 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 of these validation sets. We can then carry them on these tools to uh, the structural scale. So uh, here on the an example of an earthquake here, the pancaking of the structures on the left hand side, reinforced concrete on the right hand side, uh, uh, the uh, wooden structure. As you can see, these tools are extremely powerful in order to uh, predict localized failure, for instance, here at these joints, but as well as uh, uh, structural failure as seen on the, on the right. Well, and then there is uh, quantities in physics which we can use in order to uh, predict uh, um, uh, to, to take all this data and uh, try to understand how, uh, whether or not uh, a building within a community is prone to high failure rate or not. So the quantity which we are looking at here is what is called the kinetic temperature. 
For those of you less familiar with gas physics, let me just remind you, we never know what the temperature is. The temperature actually of a gas is nothing else but the kinetic energy of all the gas atoms, so the, defined by their uh, collision rate, divided by the Boltzmann uh, constant here and the dimension of uh, the problem. So we can apply the same technique actually to a structure by considering the kinetic energy here of uh, a structure, you see it here in the test, and determine the kinetic temperature evolution. An important point about this phenomenon here, this is a buckling test of a wood uh, structure, is that when a system uh, uh, loses stability, even if it doesn't break, uh, it, um, it does not uh, uh, come to an equilibrium temperature, meaning here in this case to the static situation. So we can use this kinetic temperature as a order parameter in order to, well, to define actually temperature maps of buildings in a community and classify in this way their resilience or non-resilience. Well, as we are at the building scale, we can then ask questions, let's see, you know, how can we enhance the resilience at, at the building scale, considering the interactions not only of beam type structures, but as well uh, here with um, uh, shear walls. And as you would expect, uh, the concrete with walls um, um, uh, has a much higher uh, resilience or uh, 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 actually robustness, that's robustness than uh, concrete without walls. Um, and uh, it, it developed in this way, um, uh, it, uh, these, these uh, fragility curves of buildings whether these are uh, wood with concrete walls, concrete without walls, concrete with concrete walls. So to have all these fragility curves ready to employ them uh, uh, for uh, determination of the damage inventory of structures. So the second learn is structures. The structure's fragility is a matter of bond breakage. And the classical tools of engineering can't capture these bond breakage and these fluctuation of structural elements because they only focus on the strong bonds by design. Whereas the approach which we here propose not only can capture the strong bonds, the structural elements, but also the non-structural elements. So these tools are readily available now and can be used uh, for this purpose. So just before uh, I end, let me also say that we have developed a similar approach for, for flooding and, and fire. So flooding here is the other big uh, uh, problem, which is uh, the fact that uh, precipitation rate will increase over time and leads to uh, flooding. Classically, this is done with a set called of equations called the shallow water equations and follow the flooding in time and space. And that's an approach which is particularly critical for urban flash floods. However, the approach which we are using here uh, uh, is focused on addressing flooding at a community scale but not on a community scale, at uh, a state scale and uh, a country scale, so to evaluate the possible damage caused by flooding. So for that reason, we use another approach, an equilibrium-based approach, which we uh, use by analogy uh, uh, from uh, the science of porous materials. So for instance, if you think about the battery in your iPhone, how it was designed, it was designed with these type of tools, uh, where uh, computational tools, which um, uh, um, allow you uh, to find out uh, 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 how much water or chemicals which are coming from the outside can be stored with, uh, within a porous material. We use that approach, so-called density functional theory, DFT, by analogy for uh, a 3D city neighborhood. Um, an approach which is computational, very inexpensive, has as inputs, the classical one you would expect for any type of problem of uh, flooding, meaning the topography, uh, topography of the city, the city elements, building, roads, 
permeable roads, impermeable roads, and all the calculations are done on uh, the lattice. And in addition, for engineering purposes, it has a very small number of parameters. So to give you some examples here, we calibrated this type of uh, uh, approach uh, for the MIT campus for which uh, we have a collaboration with MIT's Office of uh, Sustainability uh, in charge of developing flood engineering solutions for uh, uh, our campus and uh, for which they have very sophisticated simulation tools uh, done by um, one of our collaborators, uh, uh, Katya, who uh, has been developing this year. So we're using these refined uh, 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 hydrodynamic solutions in order to calibrate uh, our approach. So what we simulate here are streets, sidewalks, footpaths, buildings, and drainage systems of uh, 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 the system. And uh, uh, the first result which we obtain here is, is our so-called um, isotherms, adsorption and desorption isotherms. In function of what? Well, in function of a so-called chemical potential which mimics the precipitation rate. So the precipitation rate actually relates to the relative humidity outside. So as we increase the precipitation rate and keep it long enough constant, we see here the, the height of water increasing along the blue line. As, we, uh, the, as the precipitation slows down, we see the occurrence of this hysteresis loop. The difference between the adsorption and desorption, so the precipitation and the drying here, this hysteresis loop becomes a measure of the damage of how long the water stays in the structure and thus can be directly correlated to uh, uh, the cost, the damage and the cost. Uh, so uh, just to show you the accuracy of the approach, you see on the left-hand side, just images of uh, this computational approach, DFT, density functional theory approach. And on the other hand, the so-called ICM approach, which uh, it, it actually solves the, in much details the hydrodynamic equations. As you can see in these example here for uh, different weather conditions, so 10-year storm, 50-year storm, 100-year storms, we're doing extremely well in this comparison. In fact, if you look at the height of the water, the gauge height, of the water, you see that uh, the for uh, all these different points here, we relatively uh, get a very good correlation between these two approaches, despite the fact that they are based on completely different theories. Uh, finally, just a word about fire exposure. We've also developed this approach for uh, uh, fires where uh, a structure is subject to long-term fire as a, a hazard, which we are now face every year in an increasing part. What needs to be taken to, uh, into account for this purpose here is the fact that uh, um, concrete walls, reduction in section, the stiffness and strength loss of the material occurs with temperature. And we have similar type of uh, failure mechanisms, mechanisms for uh, wood, particularly for the connection, but also the stiffness and strength loss and failure of the elements. So uh, uh, just a word about what we consider. We consider the concrete spalling in the interactions. We consider charring of wood in the effective interaction and consider uh, the connections such as steel connections, their uh, softening uh, uh, due to long-term uh, fire exposure. Well, what type of means do we have in order to enhance resilience of uh, structures? Well, the most classical one are sprinkler systems, but there are some issues about the sprinkler system in the sense of it is the idea that a sprinkler system imposes a certain temperature when a fire occurs. However, that's not really the case. What a, a sprinkler system actually does is uh, it releases water or uh, uh, fluid in order to cool the temperature. This does not mean necessarily that the te temperature of the water, which is here imposed, is the temperature which ends up on the structural elements. In fact, as is shown here in this graph, uh, while the uh, fire temperature here 
continues increasing. You see here the, uh, um, the, the ambient temperature in front uh, of the room and the fire, which comes closest to it. But then in the back on the room of the room, it would be completely different. In other words, the design or the, the, the mechanics of such sprinkler system is uh, still an open question. So our approach actually considers here uh, this sprinkler system as an open system, open to the outside with a sprinkler system, which imposes onto the air a certain temperature. This temperature here is in interaction with the structure. And then there's a feedback control here from the energy absorbed by the structure back to the sprinkler system. So in this way, we are able actually to uh, simulate more realistically these uh, the temperature evolutions within uh, the structure. This is quite different than the current approach in structural design, where a, a prescribed sprinkler uh, 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 temperature of 100 or 300 degrees is prescribed as a condition for the system. The response is quite different if you see how the temperature actually uh, evolves. We then use this information in order to predict, again, these fragility curves. So what you can see here that uh, the current engineering approach actually uh, um, uh, underestimates actually the concrete uh, damage. Uh, it means it is not safe enough for the design purposes. So with these tools, we are able actually to bring into structural engineering this sprinkler effect as a means of enhancing the resilience of structures. Uh, uh, finally, we can then uh, consider these uh, fire resilient enhancement function of exposure time and uh, provide information about the, both the structural and the non-structural elements as required for possibly repair. So why do we bother about all these statistical physics, this information? Well, the question, last question I want to address is what is the socioeconomic impact? Uh, uh, how, to, uh, how can we uh, uh, use those tools in order to reduce the socioeconomic impact of these, ha of these hazards? Well, in the end, this will be a political decision. But what we can do is we can bring the data which we develop for uh, uh, city wind loads and for fire and kinetic temperature of structures can bring all this information together with census data. And that is precisely what uh, Benzo in our group uh, has done, uh, looking into what would be the benefit of mitigating uh, uh, hurricane uh, hazards by different means, and shown a few of them, uh, 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 before, what would be the benefit for an individual household? So here, given in thousand dollars per year in household, you see where which households would most benefit. That is bringing the information from the uh, resilience of wind, so uh, city texture effects, plus realistic resilience curve or fragility curves. Uh, together with census data through an economic model, which uh, Benzo developed together with Randy, um, uh, 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 considering uh, a spike in uh, demand for uh, certain repair, repair works, etc. So quite sophistic, sophis, uh, sophisticated uh, e economics model. But we can bring this one step further and uh, match these loss estimation with the risk for demographics in order to identify, identify who is, uh, 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 who is uh, most affected by this uh, situation. Uh, we consider different domains, whether it's uh, socioeconomic status, household composition, race, ethnicity, language, housing, transportation, uh, uh, and uh, uh, bring this data together with the fragility curves. So if we take these different parts into account here for Southeast Florida uh, households, we actually uh, realize uh, uh, the following, that uh, the 
the uh, expected annual losses per replacement cost here increases with the cost of the house. That only tells us that um, higher income uh, 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 tenants uh, live in more costly houses. So that's just one logical information. More important here is the opposite effect, which is the effect going here from uh, the hazard risk exposure uh, um, in terms of expected annual losses per replacement cost in function here of uh, the income, where we see the opposite trend. So from this analysis, we see actually that this is lower for higher income uh, 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 in this purpose. And then we can map these uh, indicators and uh, 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 quantify the share in high risk exposure uh, in the population. What we clearly see here that there is a clear trend with uh, uh, of this high exposure for uh, uh, with these social uh, indicators. Um, the answer thus, who is most touched by this yet is given by the study. The consequence of it is a political decision. So let me conclude. The perils of global warming cannot be captured from an engineering perspective by classical mean field theories, but they require methods that fully take onto account these fluctuations of the phenomena involved, whether this be the city geometry whether it's the building elements and the interaction, whether these are structural, non-structural elements, as well as the matching with the socioeconomic impact. One. Two, engineering used to be the vehicle of uh, 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 social mobility uh, uh, about now. I don't know whether it is still is. Um, in the face of global warming and its amplification of social inequalities, I believe there is a cultural social meaning to resilience and sustainability. While engineers will not be able to solve the problem politically, what they can provide is the information which links the physical attribute of a city, of buildings, of structural elements, and choice of materials to the social fabric, and thus helping to enhance the resilience of our social fabric in our country. Thank you very much.